Well, apologies for the few technical problems we had there. It is the internet after all. Um, it's just wizardry, uh, really. But thank you very much for joining us here. Me, Matt Stevens, Lucy Mannell, in uh, the red seat there for the very first ever Sigma Sports Live. A little bit of music in the background <laughs> over there. Don't worry about that. There's a, a, the whole team working on internet-based stuff in the background. But basically, this is the first one, the first ever Sigma Sports Live with myself. Hopefully, we'll be doing a few in the future. But the subject matter on this occasion, because we're in the winter, is going to be training and riding in the winter. A couple of days ago, we asked a few of you to get in contact with any questions you might want to ask me. We're going to fire a few up on the screen in a couple of moments. And without further ado, I've got my brew. I hope you've got yours. Again, apologies for the delay. We're up and running now, but let's start with the questions. And this is from Richard over on Twitter. Overshoes or dedicated winter boots or shoes or drive to work. So we've got three choices there. Now, I've, I've done all. Done all those. I've driven to work on numerous occasions. I've uh, used overshoes and I've used winter boots. Now, it, in all seriousness, though, Driving to work is, of course, an option, but we're here to talk about training and riding. So it depends on the severity, I think, Lucy, doesn't it, of, yeah. of the weather conditions that you're going to be riding in. There are a well, larger range of boots available now. There weren't something that was actually on the market until a couple of years ago, but uh, I think uh, a pair that I have worn are made by Physique. Uh, they're big, they're comfortable, and it depends on the sort of riding you want. I don't think they're necessarily um, something you really need to get, but if you're going to be riding in sub-zero temperatures, if you're riding in an area that's wet, that's slushy, they are definitely the way to go. But saying that, if you've got a really solid pair of overshoes, solid pair of cycling shoes, and you get your socks right and your shoes aren't done up too tight, you'll be fine. I mean, how do you find that riding in the kind of really cold weather? Yeah, you're set. Normally, I just um, use standard cycling shoes mm. and then I have a couple of different overshoes. So some are more over socks, a nice light option. And then I have um, some more kind of technical overshoes as well. So depending on what the weather's going to do, I stick with that. But um, I have been interested in some uh, specific winter cycling shoes. They're just a lot tougher. And the winter that we're having here in the UK at the minute is uh, not that fun. <laughs> no, definitely not. But I think one of the key tips here is just don't do your shoes up too tight. If, if you start putting two or three pairs of socks on, which I've heard some people do, all that's going to do is cut off the circulation. So the big key, whatever option you choose, is to make sure that at the box of the shoe, you've got enough room for your toes to wiggle just a little bit, yep. and that will keep the circulation going. Some people have better circulation than others. My circulation has never been that good, even when I was a lot younger. So, but I did find that a good pair of overshoes, um, a kind of medium, a kind of medium, um, medium gauge sock, and your shoes not, not done up too tightly is definitely the way to go. And of course, there's the old classic tin foil. Yeah, tin foil over, over, or your, over your socks. You can tape up. A lot of cycling shoes have uh, holes in to little help vents, ventilation yeah. in the summer. So if you put a little bit of electrical tape on there, it's really good for stopping water and slush if it's uh, icy from getting in. So that's a, another good tip as well. Yeah, and it, I think it's a really in, it's a really important question because not everybody has got a load of money to spend. We all have different kind of budgets, so you don't need to go for the winter boots. They're they're a great option, but I think. Any sort of weather conditions, you can actually prepare well with just the right sort of shoe and overshoe combination. Yep. Anyway, next Good question. Answer. Next question, please. Let's see who we've got coming up. Kay. This is Jamie on Instagram. Is it always necessary to have a separate winter bike? That is a good question. It is a good one. Again, it's budget dependent, isn't it? Not everybody yeah. can afford to have a winter bike, can yep. they? I mean, do you want to start this one off? I mean, um, yeah, I think, again, it just depends on your situation, you know, uh, your budget, how big your house or flat is. Um, yep. I luckily have just about enough space for uh, a winter bike as well as a summer bike. It means I can have mud guards fitted on that, um, completely winterproof it up. Um, and then my summer bike is, you know, nice, slick, fast tyres on there and it's clearly winter and summer and it also means that when the weather like nice weather comes around again you get back on your summer bike and you give gives you that little bit extra kind of boost as well I think yeah definitely I mean to be honest with you I haven't had a winter bike for probably five or six years now a lot of people think I've got loads and loads of bikes I generally keep a couple of bikes at any one time and generally they are like racing bikes but what I'll do if I do go out in the bad weather I'll I'll clean my bike, you yeah. know, uh, give it a really intensive clean, and that way, you know, the, the parts aren't going to be damaged, etc. One of the most dangerous things 
in relation to looking after your bike is the wear on the components. That harsh kind of winter weather, the corrosive salt, the grit yep. gets into all the moving parts. So basically, if I go out in the harsh weather on a very expensive gleaming bike, I will take the time as soon as I get back to wash it off, yeah. lubricate it, and then put it back in the dry. Yeah. But back in the day, back sort of 15, 20 years ago, I did have a dedicated winter bike. I'm used to call them hack bikes. Yeah. So it's generally a steel frame, steel or aluminium frame, a little bit heavier, full mud guards on there. So it really didn't, I mean, you still had to look after the bike, of course, but it didn't matter if it got a little bit corroded. Yeah. And also, as you said earlier on, Lucy, it meant that when you did get to the start of the racing season, or you had an option to ride in the good weather, you could jump off your heavier bike onto the light, sprightly race bike and really kind of feel that difference. So it was a real psychological boost as well. Yeah. But I think if you can afford to have a winter bike, great. But if it's just space, one bike. But the key is make sure you look after it and maintain it in those harsh winter months. Yeah. So okay. next up, we have a question from Richard on Instagram. Indoors or outdoors? Hmm. Can I reckon? start? You can start. Far away, Lucy. Uh, Good I to think... have you on the show, by the way. This is Lucy Manuel. Uh, I didn't really give her a big introduction. I, I know just as Lucy. <laughs> um... I think it's really good to have a mixture of the two. Obviously, again, it depends on uh, your setup, how much space you have at home, budget, if you can, you know, you've got space for a turbo trainer, that sort of thing. Also, the weather, you know, if it's good enough to ride outside all year round, perfect. But if it does get icy, snowy out on the roads, it's good to have um, an indoor trainer, especially now with stuff like Zwift, which yep. I know you use. Um, yeah, it's just an easier way of making sure you get your training done. Yeah, I mean, it is a really legitimate question because, uh, as, as you mentioned, I, I use Zwift. Zwift is getting increasingly more popular, and it does provide you an option to ride unencumbered and unhindered by the dangers of riding in the bad weather. Um, it's, I think it's also good to get out in the bad weather or to get your yeah. body used to it, and it depends on what you're preparing for. If you're pre preparing to race and you're racing in the Northern Hemisphere very early in the season, you kind of do need to acclimatise to riding in bad conditions because invariably... If you're racing in Belgium, in the UK, Scotland, wherever, Scandinavia, France, you are going to encounter some pretty bad weather conditions. And the same can be said midway through the year. All you need is a, is a, is a particularly difficult day, bad Which, weather conditions. A lot of rain. Yeah, a, a lot of rain. So, so I think it's about striking a balance. But when, when it's particularly icy uh, and snowy, then you've really got to look at the safety aspects yeah. as well. And, and riding indoors can mean you're riding in relative safety. But also importantly, you're getting a really good workout as yeah. well. So uh, there's, there's a balance to be had. I would say it's a mixture of indoors and outdoors. But when I was a lot younger, and we're talking about 20 odd years ago, weirdly, it's the complete opposite of what I do now. Generally, if it's icy now, I just don't go out because yeah. I don't race anymore. I don't need to risk anything. But when I was a lot younger, the icier and the more snowy it was, that was actually when I wanted to get out on the road. Yeah. I'd get my hack bike out, put some wide tires on, and go inventory, get that mountain bike on, and that's a good yeah. option as well. Yeah. You know, use your mountain bike, your cross bike. Yeah, gravel riding. My uh, winter bike is actually a cross bike, so it's nice and versatile. You know, if I do want to stay off the road, away from the ice, it's just another bit of fun to have. Yeah, so I think the simple answer to that question is a balance of the two. Yeah. You need to get outside. Depends, it depends on what your objectives are in terms of staying fit, but it's safer to stay indoors if you want to. You get a great workout and there's so many options available since Zwift there. You've got all the uh, the smart trainers that are available now. And um, even though back in the day I went out a lot in the winter, in the bad weather, I still trained a lot on the turbo trainer as well. And it wasn't quite as fun. It was a, basically a rusty old rig in the garage, but you can really stack up some quality miles and not endanger yourself. Yeah. So there you go. Cool. Next up, uh, great work by the way on the laptop there Dan Kogan the Kogmeister in the background controlling the graphics I mean it's like it's like working with Lucasfilm the way that changed in, 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 amazing this is just the beginning as well. it is just the start this is this is just day one uh, who knows where we're going to go okay Emily on Facebook has asked the best way to winterproof your bike and that's a nice little segue because yeah. we talked about that earlier on I mean how do you winterproof your bike um, so the main two things I'd say would be mud guards and tyres. Yep. Um, so mud guards, especially if you're riding in a group of people, a lot of clubs won't let you ride uh, without mud guards. It's fair and enough, isn't it? I think it's fair enough. I've been on a ride recently, and I had mud guards. I was like one of the only few to have mud guards, and uh, I was the one that getting covered in the mud because other people didn't. And I don't think that's fair. Uh, but you know, tyres as well. Obviously, when the roads get a little bit slippy, icy, 
Um, it's good to have that extra grip, extra protection, also puncture protection. You know, there's a lot of kind of rubbish on the roads that gets washed on there in the winter as well. So, and also, you don't want to be uh, at the roadside in cold conditions trying to fix a puncture. Yeah, definitely. The thing is, so many of the bikes now have far more clearance, so you yep. can use you know various different tyre options. So, you know, even a standard road frame now will give you the option to change tyres. And I think, well, a lot of people now as standard are running 25, even 28 mil tyres. You can even go up to kind of 28, 30, 32 mil yep. on, on a lot of road bikes now. So I think one of the, the biggest things, as you, as you alluded to, Lisa, is changing your tyres in the winter just to give you that extra bit of puncture protection. A bit more comfort as well. Yeah. And then when you go back onto the slightly, uh, yeah, the slightly lighter tyres, you'll definitely feel the benefit. But I think winterproofing your bike is making sure that you wash it after every single ride, regardless yeah, of it being a hack bike or your, your best bike give it a really good wash yep. and spend a bit of time on it. I mean, you know, regardless of your budget, that is, your bike is an investment, isn't it? And, um, and it's, it's very, very easy in the winter months to actually, for your bike to degrade, depending on the, on the kind of the, the quality of your components, even good components can degrade if, if they're left, even overnight. I mean, yeah. you can almost destroy a chain overnight, yeah. especially with the corrosive salts on the road. So, you know, think about how much you spent on your bike, how much you care about your bike, and actually invest that in terms of cleaning it. And I think essentially if you clean it, lubricate it well, yep. that is essentially winterproofing it as it, well as putting other stuff on it. It looks after you, doesn't it, I guess? It does, and lights as well. Make sure, I mean, a lot of people now all through the year have lights on, yep. but in the winter, because of course, it's, it never gets quite as bright, does it? And you, even three, half past three in the afternoon in the UK, for example, if you get caught short on a ride or the ride ends up being a little bit longer, always have lights on your bike throughout the day. Keep them going or at least save them until it gets gloomy. Yeah. So make sure, yeah, that you've got lights on that are working and fully charged, of course. And away you go and enjoy yeah. yourselves. Yeah. Next question. Uh, so do you think cyclists are softer now than when you are racing? And that's from Nick on Instagram. Well, thank you very much, Nick, on Instagram. I mean, it's a funny one because we talk about winter training, so training indoors on Zwift and generally just on the turbo trainer. And, and a lot of people say, when I put stuff on, on social media or, or elsewhere, you know, why don't you just go out on your bike? I mean, you, you're just soft. And I don't think it's about being soft. I just think nowadays we have far, far more choice. We have far more options to how we ride in just terms of bikes, in terms of tires, in terms of the technology available. We understand far more about the impacts of riding in different environments, nutrition. So I think back in the day, we weren't necessarily tougher we just didn't have quite as many options at our disposal. So therefore, we've kind of exposed ourselves to some of the most ridiculous riding conditions yeah. and just did it because we didn't have any choice. Yeah. Now, you can be a little bit more discerning about where and when you ride. and It doesn't mean you're any tougher at all. I just think we did have harsher conditions. We didn't have quite the kind of equipment yeah. or the clothing. I think the, the big key for me was the clothing back in the day. Uh, I've got a classic little story. Woke up for work back in the mid 90s when I used to ride to work. It was a 25 mile trip to work and then I used to ride back again, 50 mile round trip. And it was about minus six and minus seven. Set out in my winter gloves, got a mile up the road and my hands already frozen. So I doubled back, went back into the house and thought, I'm not gonna get to work, my hands are so cold. So what I did, I got a pair of football socks, cut holes in the heels, put those over my gloves, they're halfway up my arm. Luckily it was dark most of the way so nobody could see me because I looked like an absolute loon. <laughs> But it kept my hands warm. Um, but nowadays, would anybody do that? Would they be, would they be quite as I don't know, ingenious, I guess? But the fact is, we have so much better kit now. And the, the kit that's available on the Sigma Sport yeah. website, for example, without being too kind of silly, there is so much kit to yeah. keep you warm. It has moved on in leaps and bounds. Yeah, I think that's the thing about, um, you know, if you're thinking about riding in winter outside, we have so much good kit available yeah. now. You know, jackets, it's overshoes. Easier to, it's like, easier to overdress now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, we've got so much good kit and it's kind of the getting out on your bike is kind of, even though you have the good kit, you don't want to risk it in the ice sometimes, you know, if the weather conditions are like that. But I think we're very lucky with all the options that we do have now. Yeah, I, I, think, I think to answer that question succinctly, I think it's your perception on what we used to do in the olden days, as it were. Well, not really that, it's only like 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, but things have changed dramatically. People have far more choice you can still be hard and get out on the roads. It's how hard you train, basically. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we had it tougher, I guess, but only because we didn't have any choice. Yeah, you had no Simple option. as that. I'm going to look out for uh, people wearing football socks. Yeah, I think after there. this, it could actually be a thing. So just yeah. a, a, cut, a hole, cut a hole for your thumb, 
pop them over, and the brighter the better. Um, yeah. These were white, yeah. white socks. Luminous might work quite well. Yeah, luminous. Yeah, if you do it, uh, send us your pictures because we would love to see that. Good shout. <laughs> or actually, video, video them, or get your friend to video them because otherwise you might fall off. Uh, next question. Uh, what is your favourite off-bike training? And that's Honza. from Honza. A cracking name, Honza on Instagram. So my favourite off-bike training. It's a tricky question, isn't it? It is. I mean, because nowadays I actually, to be fair, when I was when I was racing, especially when I was a lot younger, I did a lot of circuit training. So I did a little bit of running, a lot of gym work, and I used to swim quite a lot. Then that kind of changed a little bit. Um, and I did more and more on-bike training in the winter and less off-bike training. But now you see most, most elite athletes uh, across the board doing a lot of kind of gym work. Yeah. Depending on what their, uh, what their kind of aims and ambitions, depending on the types of rider they are, you'll see a lot of the sprinters doing, pushing a lot of weights. I'm talking about road riders now in the winter. But most all-rounders, or basically every single elite team, would, set, would be looking at their riders doing core work. So that's what I do now. So, I mean, I, don't, I broke my leg very badly actually riding for Sigma Sport a few years ago. That was my last ever race. So I can't run or do any really long walks because it aggravates my knee. So most of my training is on the bike, but I do a lot of core work. And although I'm getting on a bit now, my core is kind of stronger than it's ever been. I don't get any back problems on the bike. So yeah, I guess nowadays my favorite off-bike training is just 15 minutes of core every day, which I do, yeah, pretty much, yeah, like at least six, at least six times a week. It's part of my routine and it feels weird not doing it. Yeah. What about you? Um, I dabble in a little bit of running, although my legs don't really appreciate it. You don't yeah. realise the different muscles that you use uh, cycling to running. Um, I have tried a little bit of rock climbing as well during the winter. Whoa. Obviously, uh, quite Locally, different. Locally, in Kingston? Uh, yeah, there's a place uh, there just is. near. Okay. Just a bit of bouldering. It's quite good to use different muscles. You have to use your head uh, as well. Not head rock climbing, but no, you know, that's, that's skillful, engage your brain. Using your head. Um, but... Yeah, that's just something good to kind of, just totally different to cycling, but um, yeah. I think, it, like you said, you know, using your head, I think also one of the key things to off-bike training, especially in the winter months when it's a lot harder psychologically, I think, to keep yourself prepared, is the fact that if you have got a training routine, regardless of your ability, tra bike riding is beautiful, it's wonderful, but it's also really, really hard. Yeah. So I think it's important to do something off the bike to complement that, yeah. even if it's just riding a different sort of bike, if you have yeah. access to a cross bike, a bit of mountain biking, for example, just go walking. Um, what that does, I think that gives you the space to really then appreciate when you yeah. get back on your road bike. Yeah. So if you don't do any off-bike training, I'd really look at it, you know, um, depending on your physiology, depending on any like existing ailments and stuff, don't do something that's gonna aggravate a pre-existing injury or problem that you have. And look at something that you enjoy. Yeah. And you'll enjoy that, but what you'll enjoy even more when you get back to riding your bike is the benefits that that other exercise has given you, plus you'll be refreshed mentally yeah. for getting the hard miles in, won't you? Yeah. Definitely. Cool, that's a good question though, I like a that A cracker, it's, sh it's short, it's one, two, three, four, five, six words, but so important. Well done, well done, Honza. Next up. Uh, socks over or under the leg warmers. Now this is a question that um, we've asked a lot of people, mm. and uh, we'd love to hear your opinion on this as well. Yeah, it's... It's it a, separates people. It, it does. Well, the thing is, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the biggest fashion cycling questions of our time, yeah. you know, of, of the modern era, really. Um, now, a few years ago, Lucy, if you'd have asked me this question, I'd have been like, what the hell are you talking about? It's under. But now, you know, it, it, we saw it for the first time, and correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section, that it was a lot of the Belgians, a lot of the cyclocross yeah. riders used to do it while warming up uh, before races or just, just out training, where they'd have the leg warmers or the tights and then the socks over the top. And I saw it for the first time a couple of years ago. It was a rider called Tom Musen I actually did a bit of riding with. And I thought, what the hell's going on here? This is just so wrong. But I didn't want to upset the lad. I, di I didn't want to, I was going to have a bit of a chat, but I thought, Matt, leave it. He's young and he doesn't know any better. But since then, I've seen Corn. more and more riders doing it. Now it's even in the pro peloton. And you know what, though, Luce? Yeah. I've done it myself. Yeah. And I quite like it. I quite so like I'm it. So full, complete three, uh, 360, so, 180. A, bit, a, bit, a full about turn, anyway. Um, so he might have been the very person that started the whole trend, maybe. He might have been. He might have been. Of course, Matthew van der Poel, he, he wears it well. Yeah. But uh, increasingly, the few of the pros are kind of doing it. And um, 
So I still primarily wear it under, but as a little cheeky special treat. I think if you've got a nice, top, if you've got a nice, <laughs> if you've got um, a nice pair of socks, nice bright pair yeah. of socks, it's quite nice to let other people see as well. You know. Yeah, because socks are a proper thing, aren't yeah. they? So it's about They're important. And let's be honest with you, there's not that many days in the UK, if you count them throughout the year, in the northern hemisphere, that you necessarily get out, you know, with your nice socks on and. It does give you an opportunity to showcase yeah, exactly, your exactly. sock flair, yeah. um, as it were. Yeah. So, uh, and I never really thought that was a thing. But please don't do it if you're wearing mucky socks or you've got grey socks. You yeah, know, they have to be matching yeah. and clean. So that's the thing as well, isn't it? So is it okay to wear mismatched socks over the top? I mean, we, I mean this is a minefield. Oh, I Lucy. think we need to move Should to the we leave next it? question. Should we leave it? Let's move on. Yeah. Let us know what you think in the comments. Yeah, class. please do. Okay, so should you use different nutrition during winter? Interesting. Yeah, it is an interesting one. I think, I mean, generally, my eating habits, my nutritional kind of requirements as a, as a professional rider just change slightly, just depending on your training load. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of it is psychological. Um, you just need to make sure you're eating for the demands of the amount of riding you're doing. Yeah. You know, you don't want to, most people, I would say, less so these days, put on a few pounds in the winter. That, that's quite normal. Generally, the intensity and the frequency of your riding is less, so you don't actually need to eat as much. And if you're one of the riders out there that has a problem with putting on the weight or put, puts on a little bit too much weight in the winter, that's something to think about because it is easy to eat. You know, when you've got that cold weather, you generally want to eat more carbs. Yeah. You, you generally eat more comfort food like yeah. cakes, pies, all, all the kind of things that we kind of crave for in the winter, which harks back to when we were hunters and gatherers, doesn't it? We needed to get that food on board. So just... I, th I think it's just about getting the balance right and not eating too much. And I wouldn't be too too fatty, but what I would I would do if you've got a coach or if you're looking at a particular set of objectives, just make sure you've got a balanced diet and you don't eat too much and, and that you're eating to the demands of how much training you're doing. And there's a lot of information out there, a lot of nutrition brands as well, providing an increasingly broad variety of drinks and uh and, uh, and, and, and of course, like bars and stuff. I mean, it, and there's a plethora of stuff out yeah. there. But, and if in doubt, pop online and have a word. But uh, you just go easy if you're worried about gaining weight in the winter because it's quite easy to do. Yeah. Cool. Um, we're just going to have a look at the chat because we've got a couple of questions. We've got a few. So this here. is live. This yeah. isn't recorded so, unless you're watching it <laughs> tomorrow or this afternoon. Don't get confused. Let's have one of those questions. Um, so this is from Ethan. He says, do you enjoy cycling more now than when you're riding professionally that is a that's a, thank you ethan for for getting in contact that's a really really good question because funnily enough i've found myself of late speaking to people about about what i'm doing for work now and it's and it is i, I feel blessed to still be working within cycling within the sport that i love and weirdly i do actually enjoy riding now than ever before because you know i'm, a, I'm approaching 50 you know i'm still pretty able to kind of to kind of ride to get out there I'm, I'm also very lucky and fortunate to, to be able to ride in different countries and meet lots of different people from all walks of life of all abilities all enjoying riding and I think I've got such a kind of rich context to set where I am now in is this that I can actually sit back for once and actually reflect yeah. on my riding a little bit when you're training and racing as much as I enjoyed it got to see some wonderful places did some you know fantastic races um, you didn't really get the chance to soak it all up because you're moving on to the next race, you're yeah. recovering and then training. And training, most of the time for me, was pretty brutal. You know, I put myself through the mill to make sure I was in good condition. So quite often, training wasn't very nice. You yeah. know, and I used to really crave my one ride per week on a Saturday to the cafe just to enjoy it. But now, because I don't have, I like to keep myself fit, um, but I don't have to train to race. So most of the riding that I do now is at my own pace, I can go as hard or as easy as I want. I don't mind having a few days off. Um, and I can really soak up yeah. where I am. So, yeah, I'm enjoying riding more than ever right now. Yeah, I guess it's a different in enjoyment. But, um, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's, it's like, I don't, unless I kind of want to, yeah. um, which isn't very often now. Just, although they're saying that I do when I'm on Zwift and stuff. And, and if I'm going around Richmond Park and somebody overtakes me, it's like, nah, I've got to get stuck in again. So I still have that little bit of a competitive edge. But what yeah. I don't need to worry about is regularly making sure I'm, I'm, at, I'm at race fitness. And that's actually, quite, that's actually quite a relief in many ways. And just going out riding and, uh, and soaking up the atmosphere. Take, and actually, because of phones now, yeah. and the fact that I'm a bit of an Instagram fan, I can just stop 
and take a picture and enjoy the moment yeah. rather than thinking I've got to get to the top of this hill yeah, and no try and pressure. break a Strava record. It's just about just soaking it all up. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, cool, yeah, if you've got more questions, please feel free to drop them below. Um, we have got five minutes left, so five get your minutes. questions in. Yeah. We'll do one, maybe two more of these, and then hopefully uh, another question from there. Okay, but so next up on the big board, yeah. the screen, it's not a board, <laughs> tell them old I am, can't you? That is a screen, not a chalk Yeah, don't board. <laughs> with the chalk. What's worse, under or overdressing? So basically, too cold or too hot? What do you reckon? I mean, it's the personal thing, isn't it? But uh, I, I, under. Yeah. I think underdressing. Because if you overdress, what can you do, Lucy? Unzip or take things off. Indeed. Yeah. But but underdressing, you're going to have to kind of, kind of find things that's find on the road. Yeah. Or, football socks. Yeah, exactly. So I think it's definitely underdressing. Yeah. Uh, and I have been caught out a few times. And I remember um, forgetting to take a gilet with me or a cape. I mean, that's something I do all year round is just having an emergency gilet or a cape. I know that sounds like, oh, we know that, but it, it is, as well as taking ID, a bit of money, your phone, and a little toolkit, always take that extra layer, because you, you don't know when you might need it. But yep. if you haven't got it, you've, I suddenly feel like I'm kind of lost. And I've, I've been caught out a few times, and I've, I've actually scavenged at the side of the road for newspaper to stuff up my jersey. Um, and that has actually saved me, yeah. because I've, I've gone out ill-prepared. There's been a change of weather. If you go out on a four or five, our ride, start off in sunny conditions, yep. you get a downpour, you've got one layer on, you're going to be screwed. Yep. So, uh, yeah, underdressing is far worse. Overdressing, as you say, you can always take things off, stick them in your pocket or just unzip yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think even in the summer, well, I know this is about winter, but even in the summer, you can start off in the morning and uh, it can be a little bit cool and then, you know, an hour, two hours into it, the sun comes up and uh, you kind of there, but you've always got pockets to put other layers in, so... Yeah, yeah. Da- and I think the, the kit these days, as opposed to a few years ago, uh, it's so light and it's, it's really stowable. We can fold yep. it up very, very easily. So you can easily get a pair of leg warmers, arm warmers and a jelly in your back pocket or even just stuff it up your jersey and still leave room for all your other essentials as well. Yep. And of course, you've got little saddlebags to put stuff in as well. So there's no excuse really for getting it wrong. Always check the weather forecast and always have that little insurance cape or jelly in your back pocket and yep. you can't go wrong. Just in case. Well, you, you might, but, you know. Don't chance, blame us. The chances are slimmer. <laughs> but please don't get back in contact with your solicitors about that. Next cool. up. Uh, one more question from here. Uh, so what is your favourite song to listen to whilst doing efforts on the turbo? And that's from Harry on Instagram. Well, let's ask yours, because I've got a few. Because obviously like I've I... gone through quite a few musical eras. So I could talk about the 60s, the 70s, <laughs> the 80s, the noughties, and the kind of teenies, whatever. The, anyway, I'll, I'll think of mine. What are yours? I, I should have thought about this question before. Yeah, so I'd put it on the spot, Lucy. Um, just anything. Uh, um, I can't think. My mind's gone totally blank. Uh, good Spice Girls. Spice Girls. <laughs> Are they reforming? Which is great yeah. news. I tell you Spice what, Girls fans. Beyonce. I'm, I'm hoping we're going to get tickets to see them at Wembley. Beyonce. That is. Oh. She's good. All the single, all the, all the single ladies, or or, or their early, her earlier stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I know about. I do know who Beyonce is. Yeah. Uh, she's very, very good live. Apparently. I've seen her live actually. Well, she's very you have. good. There you go. Yeah. Um, we didn't plan that. That just happened. That was natural. <laughs> uh, yeah, she's very motivational. I think so. Um, she is. Yeah, she's quite good. I like depending on the efforts, but I do even when I'm on Zwift. I, I always have music in my ears. Um, at the moment, I'm listening to a lot of the Voids, Julian Casablancas from The Strokes. His sort of side project. They're amazing. Um, I also like heavy rock, yep. uh, I like The Strokes, uh, I like Queens of the Stone Age, yep. uh, but they also think. ABBA. Oh! <laughs> Do you sing along whilst doing the efforts? Uh, it depends or? how hard the effort is. Yeah. But if, it's, if I'm just riding at like, you know, 200 watts, Dancing Queen all the way. <laughs> nice. Uh, cool, I'm just going to have a look at the questions here and we'll just pick scrolling through. one more. Uh, oh, get in contact with your face while Lucy's scrolling away. We've got one more question. Stick your favourite uh, songs in the comments section, and maybe I'll get together like a turbo playlist. Yes. How about that? that is a Matt a great Stevens idea. forward slash Sigma Sports forward slash Turbo Smart Trainer playlist for the future. That could be a thing. Uh, so get in contact with your favourite songs. Cool. Um, we're going to have one more question, and it's from Nigel. Is it over to Gooden? Um, so, what do you think of e-bikes and their benefits? This is a very it's kind of non-winter related. Yeah. But it's nice to broaden things out. Yeah. Uh, and of course. You know, e-bikes aren't exclusively used in the summer months. So let's 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 answer that question. Uh, 
Do you know what? I think e-bikes are, are brilliant. I think they level the playing field. I've heard a lot of people saying that they're, you know, you know, I wouldn't be seen riding an e-bike, but what they allow you to do, what they allow people to do is for the first time get on a bike and explore, get to work, get to the shops without resorting to using yeah, a car. It's just getting out um, there. It's getting out there. Um, and a lot of people live in very, very difficult hilly terrain as well. And, and some, some, sometimes the stumbling block for a lot of people is their level of fitness, initial level of fitness. I've got a really steep hill to ride up. I'm not prepared to kind of do that. Um, so they, they level the playing field in, th in that sense. And also they can, they can take you further yep. for, for, for less or the, or the same energy. And also that another, another way of leveling the, play, leveling the playing field is you can go out with somebody you know, who's less fit, a mate, uh, a member of your family, who perhaps wants to share the experience and, and, the, one, and the wonderfulness of just going out on your bike. Yeah. But because of the fitness, they might not be able to do it. So you, know, you can be riding along at 200 watts, they can put out 100 yeah. and, and ride at the same speed as you. So I think it's, it basically opens things up. Yeah. It, it's getting more people on bikes. And I know from speaking to several people that, a lot of people have started out on e-bikes and then actually gone onto road bikes as yep. their fitness has improved because what you've got to understand is, is that you can still ride really hard on an e-bike. It's just going to be making up um, that little bit more to get you over that kind of steep yeah. or that long climb or enable you to ride with people who are just that little bit quicker yeah. and fitter than you. And, and also it's, it's a, it gets more people into, into the bike industry as well. It just opens things right up and I think they are definitely the way to go. The tech's getting better and better. Yeah. I think... You know, I know, I don't know the exact projections for e-bikes, but it's absolutely enormous. And I think it's only a good thing to complement, you know, existing bikes, to be perfectly honest with you. I think 100% yeah. is the way to go. Cool. Uh, we've got a fan of uh, you starting a Spotify playlist, which is good. Oh, good stuff. One fan and then. So that's pretty much, we greenlit that <laughs> yeah. project. Dan, write that down. Here we go. But <laughs> thank you soon. very much, whoever uh, that was. <laughs> and also uh, Dancing Queen all the way, apparently. Oh, great stuff. And it is, it's, it, it is a tune for the ages. Cool. Uh, so we're going to finish here for today, up. I think. Um, we're going to play uh, one of the Winter Riser video, I believe. Um, yeah, okay. Well, we'll, we'll throw, throw to that. That is that. There was a lot of outtakes. Play that us was, out. Yeah, that's yeah. a great video. The Winter Riser video. But hopefully we're going to do this again very, very soon. Please get in contact with how you thought this went and also the sorts, sorts of topics that you'd like us to discuss in the future. Because I've really enjoyed that. Yeah, I've really, quite good. really enjoyed it. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And, yeah. and thanks very much for all your questions. It really does mean a lot. And as I said, get in contact in the comment section over on Facebook, over on Twitter, over on our Instagrams as yep. well. Instagrams, is that even a thing? But oh. more importantly, make sure you subscribe to the, to, to the uh, YouTube channel of, of Sigma Sports uh, and take it from there. That yeah. was nearly a little bit of a naughty faux pas, but you know what I'm talking <laughs> about. You know, you know where I'm from. Uh, yeah, give us a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to our channel. But thank you very much for watching and uh, we'll see you next time. This can't be happening. Please stop raining and get warm again, you absolute bastard. It's no use. What's the point? If only there were specific measures I could take to make the most of this horrible weather. Hold on a minute. I've got an idea. Matt Stevens is The Winterizer. Starring Wet Lube. Lights. Winter Tires. There was just one thing missing. My guards. With the bike sorted, it was time to winterize myself.
it's actually quite mild. Oh well. Winterize yourself at sigmasports.com. No idea. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> 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 <laughs>